Today I want to look at a classic result that you might learn in an abstract algebra class or more properly a group theory class or an abstract algebra class that covers group theory. And well, it's called Cauchy's theorem. But in order to really understand what it's saying, let's look at the definition of a group and then some examples of groups. So we'll say that a group is a set G together with an associative operation, which we'll call star. But really, we often don't write the star. We just write two elements of the group next to each other and understand that they have been combined via that operation. And then we have to have the following, you know, axioms satisfied. So there's a special element from G called the identity element, which we'll call E. And it has the property that if you combine it with any group element on either side, you get the group element back. And well, this is, like I said, has to be true for every group element. And then you also have an inverse for every group element. So in other words, for all G, you could find, like I said, an inverse element, which we'll call G inverse, so that when you combine these elements, you get back to the identity. Okay, so let's look at some examples, some that are really kind of arithmetic, and some that really get to the heart of what most groups are about, if you will. So maybe the arithmetic additive groups would be like the integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, and the complex numbers. So pretty clearly here, the identity, as discussed over here, is simply the number zero. If you add anything to zero, well, that thing doesn't change. And then inverses are simply negations of the whatever number you're at. So the inverse of four would be negative four. That's because four plus negative four is zero. You're back to the identity. Now you can make multiplicative versions of these groups if you throw away the number zero. And so we'll denote that by Q times here. That's what I'll say. But like I said, that's just rational numbers minus zero. Doesn't exactly work with the integers because well, there's no inverse for you know, two within the integers, you need one half there. And then there you've got non-zero reals and non-zero complex numbers, like I said, with multiplication. And then you've got Zn, which, you know, really this is the set of equivalence classes mod n, but let's just think about it as the set of numbers between zero and n minus one with modular addition. So what I mean by that is the operation is you just plain old add the numbers, then you divide by n and keep the remainder. So for instance, in Z6, if you do four plus five, you get nine, divide that by six, keep the remainder, it is three. And then, like I said, we're gonna discuss a couple of better examples. Let's maybe look at matrices with non-zero determinant and matrix multiplication. Here we got two by two matrices. Now, what makes this more interesting is, well, first of all, it's not commutative like these up here were. So notice over here, there was no rule that the group had to be commutative, but maybe more interestingly is that there's a natural space that this group acts on and it acts on vectors in the plane. And really the good way of thinking about groups is, or elements of groups, is that they are functions themselves. So here you can think about a matrix as a function that does something to a vector. Of course, from linear algebra, we know that it scales and rotates a vector. But, you know, we don't really need to know that just to maybe understand that this group is made up of functions, functions that act on vectors. And then we've got another group called DN, the dihedral group, and that's symmetries of a regular n-gon. And well, this naturally acts on a regular n-gon by performing reflections and rotations. Oh, I guess I missed the fact that sometimes up here matrices can also be reflections, but that's a small detail. And then down here, we've got the symmetric group SN, which is all permutations of the set from one to n. And well, this kind of obviously acts on one to n. So notice that all of these groups down here are made up of things that act on other things. 
which, like I said, is maybe a more proper way of thinking about a group than this arithmetic version up here. Okay, so now that we've discussed groups a little bit, let's look at the result we want to prove and prove it. So what we want to prove today is something called Cauchy's theorem. And it says that if we have a finite group, G, and then we have a prime that divides the order of G, the number of elements in G, then there is an element of order P. So what does it mean to be an element of order P? Well, it means that if you combine that element with itself P times, you get back to the identity. Whereas if you do it less than P times, you are never equal to the identity. So in other words, let's say that element of order P was G. Then you would have G is not equal to the identity but then g squared, g cubed, all the way up to g to the p minus one are also not equal to the identity, but g to the p power is equal to the identity. So this kind of very obviously happens in z6, for instance. Observe that the number two has an order of three, and three is a prime dividing six, the order of the group. That's because two plus two plus two is six, which is equal to zero, you're back, e you're back equal to the identity there. Okay, great. So let's see how this proofs go proof goes. So let's introduce the notation of G equals M times P. So if P is a prime dividing the order of G, then we can write the order of G as, well, a multiple of P. And I think this is maybe the best multiple of P, MP. Okay, and then what we're going to do is consider the following set. And that set will be made up of some ordered P tuples. So let's maybe call that set S. And it'll be everything of the form G1, G2, G3, all the way up to G sub P. And it satisfies well, some rules, and first of all, all of these G's are inside of G, otherwise it wouldn't really make any sense for our purposes. And if you combine them all together, G1, G2, all the way up to GP, you get the identity. And now next up, what I wanna notice is the shape of an element inside of S. So notice if we've got an element G1, G2, up to GP inside of S, then that's equivalent to saying that if we combine these all together, we get the identity. But we can kind of solve that for GP, and we can do that by multiplying by the inverse of this big chunk that I have in orange parentheses here. So that's gonna tell us that GP is in fact equal to GP minus one inverse times GP minus two inverse, all the way down G2 inverse, G1 inverse, where here we've used the fact that if you take the inverse of that big chunk in orange, then you're gonna switch the order of multiplication. Now, next up, let's define an equivalence relation on S. So we did some videos on equivalence relations in the past, that's just maybe a loosened version of equality. And well, we're gonna say that two things are equivalent, so like G1, G2, all the way up to GP is equivalent to, for instance, H1 all the way up to HP, if one is a permutation of the other. So in other words, if there exists some sigma inside of SP, remember that's the set of permutations on the elements from one to P, which are the indices here, so that we have maybe H sub I is equal to G sigma I for all I. So in other words, just to put it very, very simply, these two things are equivalent if there is some way to shuffle these H's around so it looks exactly like these G's. Okay, and next up, we wanna look at the size of some equivalence classes. So what do I mean by an equivalence class? Well, the equivalence class of G1 to GP, that's simply gonna be 
all of the p-tuples that are equivalent to this. So in other words, it's going to be h1 up to hp such that, um, let's see, h1 up to hp is equivalent to g1 up to gp. Great. And now let's notice there are really two cases here. This equivalence class could have one element or it could have more than one element. And well, we really wanna look at the case when it has more than one element for a minute. So let's do that. Okay, so let's look at this equivalence class that we had before and I wanna underscore the fact that these things over here have to come from S. So they have to have that rule that if you combine them together, you get, you get back to the identity. So it's not all permutations, it's permutations that still make that satisfied, that product being the identity satisfied. So let's notice that there are really two possibilities here that we want to look at. The first possibility is this case if G1 to GP equals, well, just GGG. In other words, all of these entries are the same. But if that's the case, then the equivalence class is one, because notice all the permutations of a tuple with all of the same elements is, well, it's, it never changes, right? And so the second case would be if you have two entries here that are not equal, at least two entries here that are not equal. So I've got that here. There exists i and j where gi is not equal to gj. And now what I wanna notice from this point is you get all cyclic permutations of maybe the element that's producing the equivalence class. And so, well, what do I mean by that? Well, let's write this down. Maybe let's write it down in the P equals three case, um, just because that'll be illustrative enough for the general case. So let's say we've got G1, G2, and then next we're gonna have G2 inverse, G1 inverse. And uh, I'm making sure to write it like that based off of the little calculation we did before, how the last entry really depends on the first entries. Okay, so let's see who is inside of this. Well, definitely we have G1, G2, and then G2 inverse, G1 inverse is inside of this. But then, like I said, we're gonna get cyclic permutations. Those are permutations where you just like spin this around like a wheel. There's no shuffling, if you will. So let's see, the next one would be, uh, let's put it down here, G2, G2 inverse, G1 inverse, G1. So notice if you were to really get rid of the commas there and multiply everything together, you would definitely get the identity because G2 still hits its inverse and G1 still hits its inverse. And what we've done is like one you know, application of a cyclic permutation. And then the next one would be G2 inverse, G1 inverse, and then G1, G2. That would be another application of that cyclic permutation. And now perhaps more things are in there as well. Perhaps we're lucky enough to have some non-cyclic permutations of this element also inside of the equ equivalence class but those will all come in triples. And those will all come in triples because you'll get the cyclic permutations of those as well. So I'll just put that over here as something, 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 and that's gonna continue on and on and on. So the important thing here is that these things are happening in triples. So since these things are happening in triples, in this case, the case where you have you know, elements that are entries of these tuples not equal, you always get a multiple of the prime for the number of elements in this uh, equivalence class. So in other words, the number of elements in this case of the equivalence class G1, G2, all the way up to, let's call it GP, I guess it will be, will be equal to, like I said, a multiple of P, let's say K times Okay, so now we're pretty much ready to put it all together. Okay, so now let's recall a fact about equivalence classes, and that is 
their disjoint union is, well, the entire set we're working with here. But the set we're working with here is, well, it's going to be not the whole group. It's going to be this set S from before. And then next thing what I'd like to notice is that we can count the number of elements in the set S. And well, we can do that just by looking at this P tuple down here and observe that you get n choices for each of the first P minus one entries because those are freely chosen. And then the last entry is the inverse of the product of those. So there's only one choice for that. So since you've got n choices for each of the p minus one entries, then that means this is equal to n to the p minus one. But the important thing here is that this is a multiple of p. Well, notice that n was equal to m times p. So let's maybe collapse it down to a capital M times p. Again, another multiple of p, or that's the size I should say, which we'll use in just a second. Okay. So now let's turn this disjoint union into a sum of sizes. So we have the size of S, like we just discussed, was a multiple of P, so I'll call it capital M times P. And then next up, we're gonna have um, a bunch of ones added to each other for all of the equivalence classes with one entry in each of the spots. So this is going to be 1 plus 1 plus, and a priori, there may only be zero ones there. We're not totally sure about that, but we'll argue that it's not that in just a minute. And then next up, we'll have plus these others. But remember, every other equivalence class had a number of elements, which was a multiple of P. So for instance, it's like K1P plus K2P plus all the way up to, maybe we'll call it KJP. But now let's notice that this M times P is a multiple of P. That big sum over there is also a multiple of P. That means that this is also a multiple of P. And now we just have to argue that there is at least one equivalence class with only one entry. And in fact, there is. And that would be the equivalence class of all identity elements. So we've got E, E, E. So that's definitely in S because if we combine it together, we get E. But then that also only contains the P tuple with all E's. So that means that this is bigger than zero, strictly bigger than zero. It's also a multiple of P. But that means it has at least, well, two of these terms in here. And what we'll do is take one not connected to being just the identity, and we'll look at that. So in other words, there exists something g comma g comma g inside of s with g not equal to the identity. Oh, but then check it out. We can multiply all of those together and we'll get g to the p equals the identity given the fact that that tuple is inside of s. And now, well, how do we know that no smaller power of g is equal to the identity? Well, I'm not actually going to cover that carefully. That's in something called Lagrange's theorem, which perhaps we'll look at later. And that's a good place to stop.